Now, very happy to welcome our next guest to the show as we look forward to the Olympics. Liz McColgan will be a name very familiar to athletics fans of the 80s and 90s, Scottish middle distance runner. In 1991 in Tokyo, her finest hour, she won the 10,000 metres world championship. That same year, she was named BBC Sports Personality of the Year, ahead of the likes of Will Carlin and Gary Lineker. Three years before that, at the 88 Games in Seoul, she won silver also in the 10,000 metres. And this year at Tokyo, you'll be watching her daughter Eilish competing at the Games in the same event, the 10,000 metres, at her third Olympic Games. Great to say Liz McColgan joins us now. Liz, great to have you with us. Thanks so much. Hi, thanks for inviting me on. So, I mean, it's it's mad, isn't it? Like mother, like daughter. You reached three games as well. I think just three Scottish women have made three, Lee McConnell and now the two McColgans. So that's a pretty yeah. cool achievement. Yeah, it's quite a, a sign of longevity when you get to three because they're every four years, aren't they? So, um, yeah, so it's quite special to make, you know, three. Um, and I think even more special that my daughter has sort of equalised what I did uh, as a professional athlete. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of similarities running along the whole traits of what Ailish did, you know, as a, you know, she's matured into the distance runner that she is. And um, it's great that, you know, um, you know, had the career that I had, but it's even better actually watching her progress and do what she's doing at the moment. Mm. She's coming after you. So your 1991 national record in the 10,000, 30 minutes, 57. And her B P B at the moment is 30 minutes, 58. So yeah. she is hunting you down. I want the honest answer here. You do not want her breaking this record. Come on. No, I do actually, because <laughs> I, I've known all along um, that Ailish was a better runner than me. And, and it's took Ailish an awfully long time to believe that herself, because, you know, um, it's very, very difficult when you're following the path of someone that's been successful. But it's even worse when it's a parent. And, um, you know, she's had a lot of kind of negative things happen to her throughout her running career. And I've always had the belief that, you know, I've known since she was 12 years old that she's capable of running and that, you know, from what I've seen as I'm coaching her um, from the age of 12, um, is that she has the ability and she's a lot faster than me. Um, maybe in the early years, she wasn't as tough mentally as me, but she's now got that in her, you know, in her chain now too. So, um, you know, I, over the years, I've known for a long, long time that she's a lot better than what I was. Wow. Um, I never really achieved the times that I should have. I was a bit slower than what I actually trained. You know, I trained a lot faster than I actually got in, in the performances that I did. Um, so Ailish, I think, will really sh just shatter my 10K for one, and she'll definitely get my marathon um, 226, that's for sure. Why did you train faster than you raced? Um, I think back in the day, we didn't have the technology that we've got just now, you know, we don't have like super shoes, we don't have lights that are leading us, we didn't have pacers, you know, um, back in the day, I was kind of the pacer, um, you know, I had a, a bit of um, a thing in my head that, you know, I didn't see the point in going into races and just letting people sprint past me all the time, so, you know, I really took a lot of the races on myself, and when you do that, you know, it's a lot harder to actually, um, you, you know, go and, and aim for a time per se rather than just trying to win a race mm. um so there weren't like time trials and that back then you know they were proper racing um you had to respect what everybody else in the race was doing and so a lot of the times you know it would be um you know more tactical rather than like eyeballs out and everybody going for a fast time because it yeah. very 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 rarely happened in my career that I could actually start on stand on a start line knowing that everybody was going for a you know sub 8 30 or a sub 15 uh, 14 50 or a sub 31 minutes it just didn't happen back then yeah I do want to talk to you about your career and hear about your career and there is like this weird amazing symmetry Tokyo 91 10,000 meters world champion and here we are 30 years later and your daughter is going to her third Olympic Games again back in the same city it's quite extraordinary so you said there Liz you've been coaching her maybe since the age of 12 how does her training and I know you've talked about the difference in, in racing there but how does her training in 2021 differ from your training in 1991 I presume it's moved on a lot or has it yeah, it's, it's completely different because she's a completely different athlete. Her strengths were, uh, are not the same as what my strengths were. Okay. Um, Ailish has got a lot more top end speed. Takes a bit of time to get there, but when she's in gear, she, you know, she's got a good turnover where um, I, I was more a strength based. You know, I had to be good pace from like, you know, if you were doing a 10K, I'd be like thinking from 5K out, how am I going to win this sort of thing? 
um, you know, so completely different athletes. Um, but at the end of the day, we came from, you know, I, I don't train Eilish like the way I did. I did a lot of high miles. Eilish doesn't do, um, you know, she probably does like a third of the miles, two thirds of the miles that I do. Um, she does a lot more quality in her running. Um, so there's there's no comparison as to what the training sessions is like. The only good thing that I I bring to the table is obviously you know being there and did that, and I kind of know the distance really well and what it takes to be successful at it. And obviously because I've had the opportunity to work with Alice since she was like twelve right through now she's thirty. You know you, you gather a lot of information on what that athlete t- you know what makes her tick. Mm. And as a coach. You know, I've been very fortunate, you know, normally you'll lose your athletes, you know, to other coaches and all this sort of stuff as they grow up. And so fortunately for me, I've been able to coach what was a wee girl into a woman. And I kind of know her inside out and I kind of know what makes her run well now, especially with the distances that we're moving up to. Yeah. And um, obviously my background in running and what I believe the ethos of endurance running is, it, it fits well with Ailish. Yeah, Christmas dinner would be a bit awkward if she got rid of you as the coach, I think. <laughs> uh-huh. it, there was Great. actually a, an instance where she was actually told um, to get rid of me for funding. So um, okay. yeah, we've been through quite a quite a, a lot of issues um, with Ailish, um trying to keep her, you know, progressing. And there were several people who thought that um, the partnership wasn't good. And um, you know, for a, a small period of time. Um, because of our funding and for to keep her on funding, we did contemplate, okay, we'll do what they want and let's go and get you another coach. But she just didn't feel comfortable at all with the people that she was talking to and, you know, it never materialised and we just thought, well, if you're going to lose your funding, we'll lose it and we'll just keep and, doing what we're doing. And that sounds a bit odd. What would be the logic behind, well, we'll fund you if your mother's not your coach? Why would that matter to funding? <laughs> just the people in charge, like, you know, uh, class personalities probably didn't like me personally as a coach it happens even at the highest of the athletics field it happens and um you know it was a situation that arose and we tried to you know um sort of we tried to support the, what was best for Ailish and certain people in charge just thought that I wasn't the best situation for Ailish as a coach which I thought was a bit um out of order but mm. you know that that's that was the situation we were in back then but um luckily for Ailish um you know, we we kind of kept working together and kept it tight and kept moving forward. And, you know, um, the people that did say that now are in a lot worse positions than us now. So, you know. And, you know, so I, I take your point that she's a different athlete to you and has different strengths. So you trained differently. And, and I presume that applies to all athletes of all eras. They will all train a bit differently depending on their strengths. But as a general rule, as a general rule, in so much as there can be a general rule, would the athletes of today be doing fewer miles than your generation? No, I think it, I think it's a right mixed bag, isn't it? I mean, right. yeah, I think that there's, like, when I was sort of running, it was kind of like the ethos of you had to do lots of miles for to be an endurance runner, and I think it's kind of changed a lot because there's a lot of um, athletes out there that, you know, can't sustain, you know, they're not strong enough to do all those miles. And, you know, you're, they're finding now with uh, sort of new information that comes out about cross training and beneficial, um, you know, sort of um, underwater treadmills. And, you know, there's not an awful lot of other things out there that technically support you better rather than pounding. And a lot of people's body aren't robust enough for that. So, you know, I think that as we've sort of moved on, we've had a little bit more um, technical input and a little bit more science support that kind of helps people um, that are of that ilk that can't do the types of miles that I used to do. But that doesn't mean to say that they're any less an athlete because every athlete has got to find their way and they've got to find their programme that supports them to be the best that they could be. Mm. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about supporting the athlete to run as fast as they can. And just because you run 75 miles and do you know 30 hours of cross chain doesn't mean to say you're any less a runner than someone that does 120 20 miles a week. But it also means too that you can't beat that person, you know, um, because you're still training, you're still getting the hours in. And still working the heart and lungs, you're just doing it in a different way. So, Whitfield Estate, Dundee, mm-hmm. you're growing up. Are you from a running family? Is running in, in the genes, or where does all this come from? No, 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 no. My family were probably, my mum and dad were probably the most unhealthiest people you'd ever get. You know, um, I mean, when I was 12, I was heavier than I am now because of bad diet, you know, fried bread, you know, cheap cheap fried food all the time. Um, Mum and dad smoked about 60 cigarettes a day. Okay. Um, you know, so it wasn't a nice, healthy environment. Nice. 
Um, I think for me, there's something sporty genetically because like my family actually came from Sligo, uh, my dad's side of the family. I had a lot of boxers. So there's a lot of sort of like fitness in the Lynch's side um, of, of what we were. But um, when we kind of researched my dad's side in that, you know, everybody was saying, well, there's never been a runner, but there has been a lot of um, men that were, you know, into boxing and stuff like that so you know I suppose you know somewhere down the, the, the genetic tree there's mm. some sort of sporty ability but within my immediate family um, I had one brother that played football um, was a pretty decent football player um, until he got injured and he you know he kind of sort of stopped playing when he was in his 20s so um, nothing that nothing that kind of came out that you know um, I'd be good at sport the only thing that I that was good about athletics for me was when I was younger I didn't have a lot of opportunities um because of you know we were in a council estate and um you didn't get a lot of opportunities to do anything and I was never engaged at school so for me um I used to just you know love all the sport and things like you know um the PE department kind of took me under the wing and I was more into hockey and football and doing all the things with the sport um at, at school and when running came along um, because it didn't cost anything um, for me personally, um, it was a great engagement for the way my mindset was, you know, um, I had um, a lot of bother in my childhood and for me to go running was a way like of escapism, you know, I kind of got into my right. own little world and I was able to go out and nobody can bother me and whatever and um, I think that you know, I've kind of trained like a Kenyan without even knowing it because I just used to go out and, and run for miles and, you know, I'd run to school, I'd run to training. Um, so, you know, there's a big, big base that I did as a child without really, really understanding, yes. you know, that I was setting this big base for an endurance runner later in life. Right. I didn't realise any of that. And what was the bother, Liz? How serious was it? Um, just a lot of poverty about it and like you were kind of just left to your own devices and um, not a lot of direction, um, a lot of bullying at school, um, you know, a lot of things that just happened in that environment. Mm. Um, you know, I had a lot of, you know, yeah, certain things happened and um, I had to deal with them and, um, you know, it, it was kind of like, um, you know, when you're 12 and 13, you're still not old enough to actually deal with a lot of things that get flung at you and, um, you know, and, and it was just very, very difficult growing yeah. up. But as I say, I think that, you know, without the running, um, it would have been a lot worse for me. And I think the running kept me on the straight and narrow. Um, a lot of people that were involved around me were into drugs and alcohol. And uh, I got even bullied more because I wasn't willing to hang out with these sort of people. Um, and so it was really, really difficult for me. Yeah. Um, saving grace is when I, I did get... The opportunity to go off to America and it took me completely out of that environment and it actually gave me an insight of you know what a real runner needs to do um, yes. and it gave me the opportunity to train um, and that was you know that was like a big big turning point for me because if that had never happened I would never be sitting here in the position I am today that's for sure. Wow uh, we had um, a guest in studio last year he is a mountain of a man he climbs like k2 and everest and does all these amazing adventure pursuits and you know strong and fit and everything and he came to studio last year and he must have talked he was in for about an hour and he must have spent 25 minutes talking about the bullying he experienced at school and the effect it had on him and you know couldn't get his breakfast down in the morning thinking that the bully was waiting for him and there was just, I think more so in, in, in your day, probably and to an extent my day, and hopefully it's gone now, uh, more so from, from uh, kids these days and, and parents and teachers are more on top of it. But uh, the effects of bullying are horrific at that age and lifelong and, you know, can almost be, oh, well, that was, you know, it was just a bit of bullying. That's, that's just the way life is. But I mean, when you're going through it, it's, it's horrific. It's really, really difficult to take because, you know, the, the whole world's just on your shoulders. And my situation was it was a gang of girls who were getting directed from someone that I thought was a friend of mine, but was obviously really jealous of the fact that I was starting to run well and making, you know, get my name in the papers and whatever. And what happened with me was, you know, she used to inform them where I would be training and there'd be a group of about, you know, 10, 10 old girls all going to where I train to beat me up and so I would need to I would then need to go out of my way and you're talking about instead of being like a mile and a half up the road I might need to run five miles to get home just to be safe 
and and then they started doing it at the school you know coming to the school gate writing things on school walls about me um it was really really horrific horrific and yeah. as i say um my the, the only thing that really sort of saved me was my coach at the time harry bennett noticed there was something going on because i just got very quiet and very um you know uh, i didn't want to go to and i was saying oh you know i don't think i can come tonight and all this sort of stuff and he was like he cottoned on something was up and he called me up and says like you know you need to come down to the house and you get a, ch a chat with you and then that was when I, you know I, I was able to open up and say look this has been going on for like a year and a half it's getting worse you know everywhere i go you know there's girls sitting and beat me up um and um, he was the one that says, OK, I'm going to sort it. And, you know, he used to walk me through the park at night, um, making sure that I got home safe. Um, and he really went out of his way to actually try and, you know, make me feel that um, I could continue doing what I was doing. And what I was doing, you know, wasn't wrong. It was them that were wrong. Yes. It's them that got the problem. And, um, you know, yeah, it was, it was really, really tough for a couple of years. But um, as I say, you know, um, I was able to sort of ride it out and then, um, you know, when I was about sort of 16, 17, it kind of all, you know, girls left schools and you obviously went into yes. other things and then I wasn't the, I wasn't the one that, you know, was going to be the, the, the sounding board for them anymore, like, you know? Yeah. Oh, it sounds absolutely horrific. I can only imagine what that's like. Um, he sounds like a great man then, Harry Bennett, your coach, if you're if you're yeah. so vulnerable that you felt, you know, one, he spotted that something might have been wrong and then when you confided in him, that he, you know, he did right by you and and got you through it because, you know, those those situations can go the other way sometimes. Yeah, I always think that you know one person and one word can make a difference and it mm -hmm. makes people feel safe and things. And for me, um, Harry was a guy that you know Harry coached me since I was like um, when I went well, when I first started running. Um, I got sent along from my local school, St Saviour's. A PE teacher sent me along and um, the very first day Harry was the first guy that I met and he coached me from the age of 12 and um, even though I wasn't the best I think he saw something in me and he really took me under my wing you know it was him that kind of educated me in running you know um, I'd be doing a training session he'd be throwing books at me and say read this and read that and all the other kids were like you know why is he so interested in her like you know she's not even the best we're better than her and things like that but I think he really saw something you know and, and when I was 16 um he, he, he was always the one person that could put confidence into me because I was very, very an unconfident child because of my surroundings and the situation I was in. I wasn't the most confident. Sure. And um, he was the one that really gave me confidence to believe and to sort of be allowed to dream outside the box. You know, um, you know, like you would say, oh, you know, you're going to be a great runner and you're going to do, you know, the Commonwealth Games are going to come come in and you know you're going to run the 10k and I'd say to him but women how far is 10k and you say oh it's 25 laps and I'm like women can only run seven and a half laps what are you talking about and he says I'm telling you you're going to do it and as soon as he said it I'm like well yeah I'm going to do it so 25 laps is going to come in at some time and I'm going to do it and he was right because I ran the first 10,000 meters at the 1996 Commonwealth Games and won it so you know he, he really was ahead of his time and he was just one of these guys that um you know he just he just made made me feel that I had something special that nobody else did mm. and nobody could understand or even foresee he saw something that nobody else did. And um, if, it wouldn't, if it wasn't for him, uh, you know, I wouldn't have got the scholarship to um, the States because it was him and my uncle that actually paid for the flight because I couldn't afford the flight. Um, he paid for it with his own money. Um, you know, and he had his own family and his family were all supportive. Um, his wife, I, and these kids. And um, it was just one of these really special relationships where I was very, very, very fortunate to meet a guy who was willing to support a kid like myself and really nurture them and let them grow and um, just see that little spark of something special in them. And I think mm. that there are people out there that do make a difference. And he was one that made a massive difference in my life. God, that's amazing. Jeez, Liz, I didn't realize you were a million to one shot, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, the only sad thing was like, um, even though he predicted, you know, like I'd, you know, I'd go and do great things. Mm. Um, on my first year at university in the States, I came home that summer and um, no, it was the second summer I came home and I was, he was come to pick me up on his motorbike and we were going to go away to the Cooper Highland Games because I was going to do an 800 metre handicap race. And I got a phone call in the morning from his wife saying that he had collapsed and died on a run that morning. So when I was just for my 18th birthday, he actually passed which was um, something that was really um, 
upsetting for me because I, I just assumed he would be there for the rest mm. of my days. But he obviously, um, unfortunately, um, he wasn't. But um, obviously his legacy and what he built in me and even today, my whole ethos is always thanks to him. He's the guy that made me who I am and um, gave me the mindset that I've got and the way I think and things like that. He's the guy that really installed all that into me as a runner. Wow. And your scholarship in the States, Idaho, did you enjoy that? Was that everything you hoped it would be? It was a bit different. Um, <laughs> obviously, I'd left school at 16 with no qualification and I was working in a jute mill um, for £23.50 on Maggie's YTS scheme back then. Right. What's, what's, and, um, what's, a, what's a jute mill? Sorry, jute. Jute mill is like where you make, make it's like a, it's um, weeding. And it's like okay. you make the back of the sacks or for, say, like, you know, sacks of potatoes. You know the way you used to get those sort of straw sacks? Yes, okay. Or like the upper layer of a carpet. It's kind of like that sort of stuff. So it's like so that, looms. That's, that's juice. Right, okay. Yeah. So, so you're work, work, working in a factory there? Yeah, I was working in a factory there from, like, um, it was a long old day. It was something like start at 5.30 and finished, like, at 5 for £23.50 a week. It was a tough old thing. Mm. It wasn't great for me trying to run because Harry used to come and pick me up and I used to try and run at lunchtime or try and finish at 5.30, meet him at 6 and go and try and train. It was really difficult. And then when when um, within that year of working, I had ran 207. I was 17, I ran 207 for an 800 metres. So that, um, that put me third in Britain for my age group. And so um, this guy called me, a guy called uh, uh, was it Mike Woods from um, America for me. And he says, oh, we'd love to offer your scholarship. And I thought it was somebody messing about. And I just put the phone down on him. And for some reason, he got Harry's number. And um, Harry phoned my mum and dad. And I said, no, no, I'm not going. Because I'd never been outside Scotland or anything. I hadn't had any, any, any education. And he said, no, no, you, you need to go. He says, because if, you know, if your running can take you to see the world, what are you going to do here? You're going to do absolutely nothing. He says, um, so this is the best opportunity for you. Um, so I had to go and sit an SET test, which I passed. And then um, I got into um, the school, I, I got over in Idaho, which was a junior college for uh, BYU. And what I didn't know and what nobody told me was BYU was a Mormon school. Huh. So the first time I came across that kind of religion. Um, and I mean, as I say, I didn't have any um, finances to get there. So I had no choice. Harry was like, you know, you're going. And um, he just frog marched me down to the bus station and him and my dad and my mum put me on a bus and that was me off. I went to a place I had no idea who, where it was. Nobody I knew there. It was, you know, I was, I was absolutely devastated. I thought it was the worst decision in my life and getting made to do it when I didn't want to do it. But um, you know, went over there. Um, find it really, find it really, really hard to settle in. Um, I got put into an apartment that had um, uh, four girls, and we were um, we were um, told that we had these five guys as what we called um, brothers who had to come and teach us the the Mormon, um, you know, the Book of Mormon every Monday. We had to do like scriptures and things out of it. And um, it was just really quite overbearing for someone that's never really known anything about religion. And I wasn't able to drink tea, wasn't able to drink coffee. I got fined for wearing shorts, running to the running track. Okay. Um, it was really quite hard to settle in. But after about three months, I kind of got my feet and I kind of wised up to it. And I was able to sort of like work my way around it. And um, I think just the old sort of Scots girl kicked in. And I was like, you know, I've got to make the best what I've got. So, um, you know, my mum started sending me little secret pass packages with coffee in it and uh, Mars bars and Kit Kats and things like that. And, um, you know, I kind of sort of worked my way around saying that, you know, I didn't really need to be getting scriptures read to me and whatever. And I'd go with training or whatever. And I got a really good balance in my life. And, um, when I was there, I was there for just over a year. And within that year, as soon as I settled in, I started running really, really well. And I won every national junior title wow. um, that was available, cross country, track, indoor, um, won all that. Wow. And then I got highly recruited from uh, the two years, uh, the four year school, division two schools. And then um, I actually met my um, ex-husband, Peter, who's from Strabane. I met him out in Rexburg, Idaho. And then, um, I got offered a scholarship to Alabama and so um, I then went to Alabama and then Alabama was a massive turning point for me because 
It was a, you know, a bigger school, a lot better support. Um, the team around me was amazing. There were some great runners there. Um, so it was really challenging to train the people. And um, I won NC2A's indoor mile there as well, got second in the two mile. So I had quite a successful time at the University of Alabama. But the, the, the greatest thing there was the coach was really, really supportive of me um, and knew that I was, you know, from Europe and whatever, and that Europe racing was really important to me. So he didn't overly push me um, while I was on the American um, sort of circuit you know he said he, he would just be happy with me as long as I ran regionals and as long as I ran finals and ran them well you know he was very supportive of the way that I was training and trying to keep you know a little bit back so that when I came back to Europe I could run really, really well so it worked out well for me it was a great opportunity uh -huh. and um, great experience and it did make me uh, into a world-class athlete for sure wow life-changing that's amazing uh, can I jump ahead because I mean god I, I reckon we could talk all day here if I'm not careful so 24 years of age, you make the Olympics at Seoul. You mm -hmm. are leading in the final, I think, with 200 meters to go. And Olga Bodarenko of the Soviet Union uh, pips you. So you win a silver at the 1988 Olympic Games. Are you, yeah. are you going home thrilled to have a silver medal or is it a feeling of disappointment what what what's your where where were you at 24 in those games and what could you have done i was devastated um you know i i was really disappointed i was a bit disillusioned because i was kind of like i trained really hard going into it um i i made the mistake of um when harry died i couldn't i didn't really for me, it's a lot to do with trust as well like and i didn't really know anybody well enough to trust them to you know sort of getting close to me to be my coach and a lot you know several people tried and whatever and it uh, didn't really work out and whatever so I was self-coached up to the Commonwealth Games in 86 and then I went to the European Championships and I met a guy called John Anderson who um, was another Scottish guy and um, you know he sort of sold me a big story and um, I thought yeah yeah you know I, I think we could work with this guy and um, it kind of worked for um, just over, well, I think we, we worked together right to 88 anyway, and um, it was a big change in the training program. I could understand what he thought he was wanting to do with me, but what made me strong was, my, like, you know, my strength's my strength, you know. Um, I'm never going to be a 56 last lapper, you know, it's just not in me. And I think he tried to change me to be more speed orientated. And um, when when I, so when I got my, when in, in 88, I realised that, you know, the training wasn't the best for me. So I was a bit disappointed in myself that allowed the training to be changed in the in the way that it was. Um, and then I was also very disillusioned with, um, because of like the, the drug issue in the sport and, you know, the Soviets and uh, the Germans and stuff, you sort of got a bit disillusioned on like, you know, what do you need to do to, to beat these people that are, you know, taking drugs and things like that. And um, I kind of came back and went through a, sort of like a little depression thing of it. Right. And I was kind of like, okay, I'm just going to retire because, you know, there's no way I'm going to win against these girls and I know it. Um, and so I kind of um, had like a little semi-retirement and I decided back then that I was going to try for a baby and that never materialised. Um, and then just at the back end of like sort of, 89 going into 90, um, I was I was just sort of sitting with Peter one night and there was a, a sports programme came on and Jill, Jill Hunter, who's now Jill Bolts, was on, um, she was representing England at the Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. And um, there was a big um, interview with her saying how she was favourite to win the 10K and da da da. And um, I was sitting there and I said to Peter, oh, I'd, I'd win that 10K. And he says, well, why are you sitting there saying that? If you think you can win it, why aren't you just Go and do it. Mm. So I took myself off and um, had twelve, but, but three months training, and went over to New Zealand and got second in the three k, no, so bronze in the three k and gold in the ten k. And I actually beat Jill on that day. Um, wasn't in the best shape possible, but you know I did enough to win it. Yeah. Um, the race, luckily for me, kind of fell into my sort of like strengths. Um, and then that was me back into it again. So I kind of stopped feeling sorry for myself and got back into the game. And then sort of like, you know, it was quite determined to sort of reverse the rules, as you would say, yeah. for you know the next championships. And, and that's kind of like what I set my plans out to do, really. Yeah. And Liz, when people think of 88, 
the first thing I think of is the 100 meter race and all the doping that went on there. And, you know, just really exploded in a huge way. And um, Bodarenko from the Soviet Union, I don't think she ever tested positive. I was having a look, but obviously the state state um, sponsored doping was an issue then every but every bit as much as it has been uh, recently so you were you were aware then was this kind of like an open secret that you had your suspicions yeah. about certain countries like was it been because I, I, I'm too young to remember was it was it being talked about in the media then like would there have been pieces in the newspapers around 88 saying Soviet Union are up to no good like would the BBC TV coverage have been having a conversation saying drugs in no. the sport or was it how, how was it treated then was it just a secret amongst the athletes we just knew from the girls, like from like um, from how they performed and what they looked like, and um, you know, all year round they'd run bad, and then all of a sudden they'd be like, you know, a minute and a half quicker, okay. you know, from from the previous race, and and you know, there was a there was always communications around tables with the athletes, you know, we we, we knew who were doing it and who weren't, you know, you could just, you know, you, you kind of knew in the circles that we moved in. Um, and and, and how, an how how prevalent was it? Like when when you say you knew who it was, was and it wasn't, was, like are you uh, ha- half the uh, field more? No, you know, uh, uh, a lot of those ways were definitely at it. And I mean, right. for me, I was lucky enough I got a medal. But you know, there was people like um, I used to be in the air, uh, training. Well, I used to room with a, a girl called Kirsty Wade, and she was a Welsh girl um, who ran for Team GB in a band. 87, 88, she was running like 157. And she was probably your cleanest athlete back then. And she never got anywhere near a medal. Okay. Um, you know, and and you know, that's the sort of, you know, you're getting the crotch clovers that were running like, you know, ridiculous. Um, you know, so um, yeah, it, 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 it was very, very much a, a topic that was discussed a right. lot. Right. With a lot of the athletes. Okay. Yeah. So it, it wasn't like 10, 15 years later, you suddenly realized it was going on. You knew at the time. It's very, di- no. it's very, it's very challenging to be aware at the time. Um, and were you yeah. tempted, were you tempted to go down that route then? You know, like if they're at it, I'm at it kind of thing. Never, never. For me, running is the purest of sports. And for me, um, the reason that you go into running is about challenging yourself as to, you know, how fast can I do go? How hard can I train? And for me, and my mindset, I can't understand anybody standing on a podium knowing that they've cheated and how in their own head and heart could actually stand there and take a medal. Because for me, um, it's so far removed from what the sport is. You know, the sport is about the it's it's the purest sport of putting one foot in front of the other and who can do it faster it's yeah. not about what you inject or what your bloods are or whatever you know um and a lot of people know that they're not good enough to do that and they're quite willing you know to sort of take the shortcut um but you know um what encapsulated me about my running was the harder the training the more motivated i was you know that's the drive behind it you know it's about you know um how fast can I run you know I want to take another 10 seconds off or I want to you know and, and that that's what's encapsulating about yes. athletic performance it's not about sitting back and you know putting a needle in your arm or whatever and then thinking oh yeah I've did that well you know mm. and, and it's about living with that whole thing yourself I suppose some people really don't care and some people think well everybody's at it but that's that's a defeatist one because not everybody's at it there was a lot of um athletes that were clean and um deserved you know, better results than what they did back then. It's such a pity, isn't it? It's just such a um, such a stain on the sport, and you wonder will we ever get on top of it. So, to Liz McColgan's finest hour, Tokyo, 1991, 30 years before her daughter now runs at the Olympics, as we were saying, 10,000 meters, uh, world champion. The insane thing is that your daughter, who was running in Tokyo this year, in a couple of weeks' time, in the 10,000 meters, was born in November 90. Mm-hmm. So uh, that gives you about eight, nine months to go and win a world title, which is extraordinary. I was reading as well. This tell me this is not true. Tell me this is not true. That Nike dropped you the moment you told them you were pregnant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, obviously, um, after eight to eight, I kind of tried to get pregnant. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to go back running. Nothing's happening here. And I actually thought that I hadn't had a period for like sort of eight years or something so I just thought oh I can't get pregnant you know um that that just must be me now so when I got back into the run and the last thing I ever thought about was getting pregnant again 
And um, when I came back from New Zealand, lo and behold, I did fall pregnant and I was four months pregnant and didn't even realise that I was pregnant. Um, I'd been running like 100 odd miles a week and my breathing went funny and I was like, well, oh, you know, something wrong with my chest and all this sort of stuff. Went to doctors and did a test and I'm totally shocked that um, I was pregnant. So, you know, the first thing I did was, you know, I was four months pregnant um, and the first thing I did was, you know, I, I need to tell Nike that... Um, you know that you know i um i'm pregnant but i have every intention of getting back for the yeah, yeah. and the reply was just well that's the, the contract terminated wow jeez that's yeah. insane so uh i mean how the hell did you get back to win a world title in tokyo from giving just birth came, in november well i trained through the the but I trained smartly and you know, I wasn't going I wasn't going down to the track with a pair of spikes on and trying to do interval sessions and all this sort of thing. Um I just kind of kept myself fit and healthy, did a lot of work on my lower back and strengthening hips and um pelvises and all that sort of thing. And then as soon as I had the baby, um I just got back into it really quickly and I, I just kept it really consistent. I didn't do anything um you know that the that there was like out there i just kept it really simple really consistent and i think it was the consistency that actually got me um to the position um in nine months time uh, it took a long time for the body to get back together because um i was actually um wet at, um 12 weeks after i had her i actually got a bronze medal at the world cross country championships and um it was Although I was got a bronze medal, my body wasn't really back to in shape. You know, I was still carrying a bit of weight and things like that. So it took me a further sort of couple of months to get that into to proper um, uh, shape. And then um, I just I, I would see after about sort of uh, four four months, I, I just started really making big inroads into fitness and things were falling into place. And um, I trained really hard. You know, I was I had a treadmill in a in like a little sauna room in the house and you know I was doing like ridiculous sessions and heat and things like that making my own sort of like little chamber but um you know I, I did I, I did push it over the last sort of um four months and um kept injury free and that was the secret really wow amazing and so is that 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 must be the pinnacle does that mean you can I know you ran in Barcelona and you ran at Atlanta as well I think you were fifth in in Barcelona uh, which I guess is a is a disappointment given your world champion the year before. Does it allow you to retire happy and satisfied, or or where are you as you reflect on your career? No, I think you know your whole career is just up and downs. It's like a roller coaster. Yeah. You have like eight results, and then you have so dis- so many much more disappointing results than you do have the the glory days. But um, you know, um, I think for me, um, so one of the mistakes that I did was um after the world championships, I went right. Uh, and then accepted an invite to run New York Marathon and won that. And then as soon as I won that, it was like, oh, well, you're a marathon runner. And um, and then um, that kind of like made me move to the marathon a, little, a lot earlier than I probably would have preferred. Um, I would have liked to have just stuck at the 10K for another couple of years, had another Olympics and then moved up. But um, that wasn't, to, that, that kind of didn't really work out right. Um, and then... You know, I just kind of had up and downs in the marathon as well. You know, one London, one New York, one Tokyo uh, marathon. Um, finished second twice and third in London, second and third in Tokyo. So a couple of couple of decent yeah. podium wins at the, at the international level of the marathon. But um, I just never really, um, I would have liked to have stayed a little bit longer on the 10K. Um, but, you know, that's... When, when you look back in life and you think, oh, would there be anything that had changed? It probably would have been that. Right. But apart from that, um, yeah, it's just been a roller coaster, good and bad, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think I've been very lucky that I didn't really pick up a lot of injuries until the latter end of my career. But when I did get an injury at the latter end, it was a biggie and there was no go back, you know, there was no come back on it. And, um, right. you know, I, I kind of finished my career a little bit quicker than I thought I would have. Um, but that was kind of out of my hands by then. I picked up an injury that, yeah that was and, it. and when you're not coaching your olympian daughter now are you still getting out and running some miles is the body okay do you still love running oh i still love running um i mean i've run since i was 12 11 12 myself um i don't run technically well because <laughs> i've got a, a really bad i've got a rigid foot now because the like, i had 15 operations to my foot um oh my god and um 
after my win in London, um, I had created a, had arthritis in my feet and I created an ulcer in my toe bone that rotted the tone bone up. And I was advised to get my toe pinned and six weeks later, I'll be back. Um, and then it was like 15 operations later, oh. and two years later, and I had to uh, admit the feet because my, my, uh, I had five skin grafts as well to my foot. Um, it was in a, it, it, it was just unfortunate that um, the, the operations didn't work and then I was mm. left with a lot of issues that um, just were not compatible with running at high level anymore. So um, I kind of uh, had to retire then. And when you when you get that kind of thing flung at you, you're, it's like, you know, the mind's still in the game, but the body's not willing. And it's really, really, really hard to accept because you always think, oh, I'll get back, I'll get back, I'll get back. Yes, yes. But it's really, really difficult when you don't get back and you're talking four years down the line and you've still been trying to get back um, and it just doesn't happen for you. So I'm quite happy now that um, I'm able to go for a shuffle and it keeps me fit and it keeps my mind healthy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that's really important for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I keep I keep myself as active as I can. Um, I went and bought a bike, what, a month ago so i've been out on four bike rides <laughs> so i'm getting a bit into road biking um right. i actually quite like that it actually gives me myself and my husband something to do together because um john's quite similar he's had some injuries and can't run every day so um he's a better biker than me though um huh. but um yeah it just gives us something to do together so we've started you know we've only been on four bike rides so i, I could see me getting a little bit more into that as yeah. i get older yeah biking and swimming tend to be where we go as we get that bit older so with eilish going to tokyo and obviously the situation so uh, tricky around the world will you make it to tokyo by way of being her coach or anything or what's the verdict there fortunately there's no no um no coaches allowed at all it's wow. only the coaches that are actually on the gb team and even that their staff's going to be a lot smaller than what it would normally be for the size of team that they've got so unfortunately we're just the same as everybody else covid's put stop to a lot of um people's travel plans and things and unfortunately for me I mean I missed the first trial uh you know British trial for the Olympics um I missed that last week when Eilish won that so um yeah it was the first which I was a bit disappointed in it's not the same watching it on the telly no um, I wouldn't say so but yeah and you know so that is as it is you know you've got to accept it that's that's the world that we're living now and you, you just have to abide by you know what they're telling us to do and um yeah, so no, I won't be going. Okay. Well, listen, we wish her well. It's great to get your story, Liz. Really um, amazing kind of st uh, to go come from where you started out to where you ended up. World champion in 91, Olympic silver medalist. Uh, pretty extraordinary stuff. So uh, Liz McColgan, best of luck again to you and your family in the Olympics coming up. And thanks so much for this. Thank you.